In this chapter, we will take a look at principal component analysis. So first we will introduce what it is, how it is uh, applied, and then we will see how to use it with, as a specific example, regression based on principal components, so principal component regression. Very generally put, principal component analysis will try to explain the variance covariance structure in my dataset by using linear combinations of the original variables. So assume that we have a dataset with p variables. This dataset has a certain variance covariance structure, which is defined by those variables. If the number of variables p is large, we might be confronted with a number of problems. First of all, the more explanatory variables there are, the more unwieldy my dataset will be, so the more difficult it will be to perform statistical methods on this dataset. Secondly, the more variables there are, the more likely it is that you will encounter multicollinearity. Multicollinearity, which will also, of course, influence the results that we see. An increase in the number of variables will also mean that we need more computational power and more time to perform a certain analysis. So it will take us time and effort. And you can think of other problems. So the goal of principal component analysis, or where we will use it, is for data reduction. So if we have a large number of variables, p a large number of variables, what we want to do is we want to find a smaller number of new variables, the principal components, which are constructed using the old variables, but that will still explain the largest part of the total variation. So we will replace the original dataset, a dataset of size n times p, n observations for p variables, with a smaller dataset of size n times m. So still n observations, this will not change, but we will only use m principal components, m new variables. And then the goal is to construct those new variables, those principal components, in such a way that we can reduce the dimensionality with a lot, so we can reduce the number of variables that we need, but we will still explain most of the variance, covariance of the data. So here in the example, we go from p variables to only two principal components. So we have initially an n times p matrix, n observations, p variables. We construct the principal components. We keep only two of them, pc1 and pc2. And this gives us a new data set, a new data set of size n times 2 but in such a way that most of the information contained in the old dataset will also be available in the new dataset. So we have a random vector x, which is the combination of all the vectors x1 to xp, and we know that this has a variance covariance structure. This variance covariance structure will be defined through the variance covariance matrix, so through sigma. Recall that sigma is just the matrix with on the diagonal all the variances, and then the off-diagonal elements are the covariances, all the covariances between two different variables. Recall that sigma, the variance covariance matrix, is always symmetrical, and we also saw before that it is positive definite. This means that all the eigenvalues of the matrix will be positive. So lambda 1 up to lambda p, since we have a p times p matrix, we have p eigenvalues, which can be different or some of them can be the same, but we have p eigenvalues, which are all positive. Recall the definition of an eigenvalue and an eigenvector. So if we have a matrix, let's say A, and we multiply this with a vector x, if A times x is lambda times x, so it is a multiple of the vector itself, then this x is called an eigenvector of the matrix A, and lambda is the eigenvalue. To construct the principal components, start with linear combinations of the variables. And we will consider p linear combinations of the variables, so the same number of combinations as we have variables. So y1, our first linear combination, will be l11 times the first variable x1, plus l21 times the second variable x2, plus, 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 lp1 times xp, and we do this for y1 up to yp. So we start off with p new variables, and then later on we will see how we can reduce this number to a number which is smaller than p. We can then calculate the variance and the covariance of those new variables. Let's say we look at the variance of yh. This is the variance of the linear combination of the original variables x1 to xp. 
we then know that the variance of a sum is a sum of variances and also that the variance of a times x is a squared times x. So this gives us L1H squared times the variance of x1 plus L2H squared times the variance of x2 and so on and so on. However, this equation is only correct if all the variables are independent. This means we have to add all the combinations of covariances between two variables. However, since they are symmetric, so the covariance between x1 and x2 is the same as the covariance between x2 and x1, we will get a factor 2 in front of them. And then finally, we know that the covariance of AXBY is AB times the covariance of XY, so we can take out all the factors. We can then rewrite it in matrix notation where the first and the last part contain the coefficients from my linear combination, so L1H up to LPH. Let's denote this vector by LH, LH a vector in RP. Then the first term is LH transposed, the last one is LH. And the middle part is just the variance covariance matrix sigma. The dimension of the first one is 1 times P, the matrix is P times P, and then the last one is p times 1, so we see that the variance is indeed 1 times 1, so it is a value, a real value. So our calculation showed that the variance of yh is lh transposed times sigma times lh, and a similar calculation for the covariance between yk and yh will show that this is equal to lh transposed times sigma times lk. The basic idea in a principal component analysis is that we will construct principal components which are uncorrelated. In a geometrical sense, this means that my linear combinations will be orthogonal one to another, or statistically speaking, the correlation between two of them is always zero, or the covariance between two of those new principal components will be zero. And then the second assumption in principal component analysis is that the variance will be as large as possible when we construct those principal components. So in other words, we will look for principal components in such a way that PC1 is a linear combination of the original variable, so of x1 to xp, with the largest variance possible. So variance of y1 l1 transpose sigma l1 is maximal, but this problem does not have a unique solution. So we have to require, we have to impose an additional condition namely that L1 transpose times L1 is equal to 1. So this is a normalizing factor, a normalizing condition to make sure that the, that the solution is unique. So this gives, if we construct the principal components, that Y1, principal component 1, will be a linear combination of the original variables, written as L1 transpose times X, in such a way that the variance of this linear combination is the maximal variance that we can obtain, and additionally, we will ask that L1 transpose times L is equal to 1, so we will ask this normalizing condition. The second principal component, Y2, will then be a linear combination L2 transpose times X, again with maximal possible variance, and under the assumption that L2 transpose L2 is equal to 1, so the normalizing condition, and this y2 has to be orthogonal to y1, so the covariance between y2 and y1 has to be zero. L3 will then be the third principal component, so again a linear combination of x with maximal variance and under the assumption of the normalizing condition, but then the covariance between y3 and y2 has to be zero, and the covariance between y3 and y1 also has to be zero. And then this process continues, we look for the next principal component, which is a linear combination, maximal variance, again normality condition, and the covariance with every previous principal component has to be zero. The way to find the vectors L1 to Lp, so to find the coefficients of our linear combinations, is based on an eigenvalue decomposition of sigma. The theorem, which we will give without proof, states that if lambda1 to lambda p are the eigenvalues, and v1 to vp are the eigenvectors, so v1 is the eigenvector which corresponds to lambda1, vp is the eigenvector which corresponds to lambda p, and we have also ordered them, so lambda1 is the largest eigenvalue, 
lambda p is the smallest eigenvalue, then L1, the first set of coefficients, is equal to the V1, so to the first eigenvector, L2 is equal to V2, and Lp is equal to Vp. Hence, if we know this, Y1, my first principal component, will be V1 transpose, so the eigenvector for the first eigenvalue, times x, the vector of x1 to xp, y2 will be v2 transpose times x, and yp will be vp transpose times x. So in order to find the principal components, all we have to do is determine the eigenvectors of sigma. Once we know the eigenvectors, we can multiply them with the matrix x, and this will give us the principal components. The only thing to pay attention to is that you always do this in decreasing order, so y1, you have to use the eigenvector which corresponds to the largest eigenvalue, y2 is the eigenvector corresponding to the second largest eigenvalue, and so on. For this construction of principal components, we can also calculate the variance and the covariance. First look at the variance, so the variance of yh, we know this is vh transposed times sigma times vh, because of equation 1 on slide 6. Then we use the fact that vh is an eigenvector, so this means that sigma times vh is lambda h times vh. So we now have lambda h times vh transpose times vh. And then in the second step we use that we have the uh, normalizing condition. So vh transpose times vh is always equal to 1, and my variance of yh is equal to lambda h. Similarly, we can calculate the covariance. Covariance yk, yh, we know this is vh transposed times sigma times vk. Again, sigma times vk is lambda k times vk. Then we have lambda k times vh transposed times vk. The indices are different, so we now know that vh transposed times vk is zero, because eigenvectors are always uncorrelated. And so the covariance between yk and yh is also zero. So what do we see now? We see that the covariance is zero as it is supposed to be. So the principal components are uncorrelated, say they are orthogonal. And furthermore, the variance of yh is always equal to lambda h, so it is equal to the eigenvalue. Since we already did the eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition, we know these values. And so we don't have to calculate the variances again. So the total variance in my data set is the sum of the variance of all my different variables. So the variance of x1 plus the variance of x2 plus the variance of xp, sigma11 plus sigma22 plus sigma pp. This is the original definition of the total variance. And now we know that since we have transposed all my p variables into p principal components, the sum of the variances of all those principal components will also be equal to the total variance. So the total variance is also the sum of the variances of yh. And we just saw that these variances are equal to the eigenvalues. So it is also equal to lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda p. If we then want to calculate the proportion of total variance explained by principal component h, we will take the variance of this principal component, so the variance of yh, and we divide it by the total variance. The variance of yh is lambda h, and the total variance is lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda p. So if we look at lambda h divided by the sum of all the eigenvalues, this gives me the proportion of total variance which is explained by principal component h. We said before that we want to change or replace the p variables with a smaller number of principal components. And what we will do is we will keep the principal components in such a way that we explain a lot of the variation in my dataset. So often what we want to do is to have at least 80 to 90% of the total variance which is explained. And we will then look at the principal components to obtain this. So we start with the first principal component. We look at the proportion that is explained by the first principal component. Then we add the second. We look at the proportion explained by the second and the first. So lambda 1 plus lambda 2 divided by the total variance. If this is at least 80 to 90%, we keep two principal components. If not, we add the third principal component. So this is also why we said we want to order them from the largest 
to the smallest. So we just start with the first principal component and then we add the second one, then we add the third one, the fourth one and so on until we explain 80 to 90% of the total variance. Often we hope that this can be done with two or three principal components so that we have a large reduction with still approximately the same variation which is uh, explained. So we want to replace my p variables, my original p variables, by a very small number of principal components, ideally two or three, without loss of information or without losing a lot of information. So we want to keep as much information as possible by using as little principal components as possible. Let's illustrate the principle through a fictive example. So suppose we have three random variables, x1, x2 and x3, and we have the covariance matrix sigma as given on the slide. For sigma, we can calculate eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So you can check your course for mathematics how to do this. The eigenvalues that we find are 5.83, 2.00 and 0.17. So we have three eigenvalues. Lambda 1 is the largest, lambda 3 is the smallest. For each of the eigenvalues, we can calculate the eigenvectors v1, v2, and v3. Once we know the eigenvectors, we also know the principal components. So the first principal component is v1 transposed times x. This is 0.383 minus 0.9240 times x1, x2, x3. Or when we perform the multiplication, it is 0.383 times x1 minus 0.924 times x2 plus 0 times x3. The same way, the second principal component y2 is v2 transposed times x. So this is just x3. And then y3 is v3 transposed x. This is 0.924 times x1 plus 0.383 times x2. So once we have found the eigenvectors, it's very easy to also determine the principal components. And in this specific example, what we see is that y2 is equal to x3. So y2 is not a linear combination of the random variables. It is just equal to the third random variable. And we also see that y1 and y3 do not contain x3 at all. They are just linear combinations of x1 and x2. Why is this? This is because if we look at sigma, if we look at the covariance matrix, we see that the covariance between x3 and the other variables is zero. So the random variable x3 is already uncorrelated with x1 and x2. So if we have an uncorrelated variable, then the principal component analysis, so the principal component analysis, which is looking for variables which are uncorrelated, it will just retake, reuse this variable in itself. So one of the principal components will be equal to this uncorrelated variable and the other principal components will not use this variable at all. Let us then also check that everything that we said before is correct. So to this end, let us calculate the variance of y1 and the covariance between y1 and y2. The variance of y1 is the variance of 0.383 times x1 minus 0.924 x2. We then apply the formula for the variance. So this is 0.383 squared times the variance of x1 plus 0.924 squared times the variance of x2 minus 2 times 0.383 times minus 0.924 times the covariance between x1 and x2. We know that the variance of x1 is 1, the variance of x2 is 5, and the covariance between x1 and x2 is minus 2. If we plug in these numbers, we find that the variance of y1 is 5.83, which is equal to the first eigenvalue. So this is already correct. My variance is equal to my eigenvalues. We can do the same thing for the covariance. The covariance between y1 and y2 is the covariance between 0.838 x1 minus 0.924 x2 and the variable x3. We then apply again the formula for covariances. This will be a factor times the covariance x1 x3 plus another factor times the covariance x2 and x3 where we know the covariance x1 x3 is 0 
covariance x2, x3 is 0, so the covariance between y1 and y2 is equal to 0. And we can calculate this for every variance and every covariance, and you will see that the variance is always equal to the eigenvalue, and the covariance is always equal to 0. Furthermore, we can check the total variance. So the total variance, the original total variance is the sum of the variance of x1, the variance of x2, and the variance of x3. So this is 1 plus 5 plus 3, the diagonal of sigma, which is equal to 8. And if we do lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3, we get that the sum of those is also equal to 8. So this means that indeed the information contained by using the principal components is the same information as the one contained in my original variables. The total variance does not change using the variables or the principal components. And then finally, we need to make a selection of the principal components. So how many of those principal components will we retain? The first principal component will explain lambda 1 divided by the sum of lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 percent of the total variance. It will thus explain 5.83 divided by 8% of the variance, or a total of 72.8%. When we add the second principal component, we will have 5.83 plus 2 divided by 8, or 98% of the total variance. So if we use two principal components, almost all of the variation has been explained, and we have reduced our data set from three variables to two variables. So we will replace x1, x2, and x3 with components y1 and y2, and there is hardly any loss of information. So everything before was a theoretical approximation of principal component analysis, so it was the theory behind it. How does it now work in practice? So in practice we will have an n times p data set, so n observations for p variables. We have observations x11 up to xnp, and we can calculate then the sample mean and the sample covariance matrix. So we don't know the population mean, we estimate it through the sample mean. We don't know the covariance matrix sigma, but we will estimate it through the sample covariance matrix S. So to find the principal components, we will not use the covariance matrix sigma, but we will use the sample covariance matrix S, and we will calculate the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of S. For this example, the length, the height and the width of the carapace of 25 male turtles was measured. So you take the shield of such a turtle, and for the shield you measure how long it is, how wide it is, and how high it is. These variables are asymmetric, so to make them more symmetrical, the logarithm of length, height and width was taken. And when we then inspect the data set, we find that we have an average for the logarithm of the length of 4.725, an average of the logarithm of the width of 4.478, and an average of the logarithm of the height of 3.703. .03. And the variance covariance matrix is given by S on the slide. To find the principal components in R, we use the comment or the function PRComp, principal components, PRComp, applied to my dataset turtles m. The output is then the following. We get first the standard deviations. So standard deviation 1.15, standard deviation 2.02, and standard deviation 3.01. We know that the standard deviation is the root of the variance, and we know that the variance is equal to the eigenvalues. So the first value, 0.15, is the root of the first eigenvalue, so the root of lambda 1. The second one, 0.02, is the root of lambda 2, and 0.01 is the root of lambda 3. And then below these standard deviations, we find the principal components. The principal components which we read in the different columns, PC1, PC2, and PC3. So what we see here is that the principal component, the first principal component, is 0.68 times the length, plus 0.51 times the width, plus 0.52 times the height. Similarly, we can find the second principal component. This is minus 0.15 times the length, minus 0.59 times the width, plus 0.78 times the height, 
and then the third principal component, we use the last column, 0 0.71 times the length, minus 0 0.62 times the width, minus 0 0.32 times the height. So we find easily the principal components from our output, and then the values that we find in the column, these are called the loadings. So the first column is the loadings for the first principal component, the second column gives me the loadings for the second principal component, and the third one, the loadings for the third principal component. So the loadings are just the coefficients from my principal components. And then finally, we can determine the number of principal components. For this, we have to look at the cumulative percentage of total variance. To do this, we take the cumulative sum of the standard deviations squared, because here, these standard deviations squared, these are equal to my eigenvalues and we divide by the sum of all these eigenvalues. So for the first principal component, lambda 1 divided by lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3, this is 96%. The first and the second is 98.5%. And then of course, if we use all three principal components, we find 100%. So what we see in this specific example is that we can rely on only one principal component, the first principal component, and that this one will already explain 96% of the total variance. In this specific example, also what we see is that the first principal component has an interesting interpretation. So my first principal component, y1, is 0.683 times the logarithm of the length, plus 0 0.510 times logarithm of width, plus 0.523 times logarithm of height. If we then apply the calculation rules for a logarithm, namely that a times the logarithm of b is the logarithm of b to the power a, and that a sum of logarithms is the logarithm of a product, then we see that y1 is logarithm of the length to a power times the width to a power times the height to a power. So it can be seen sort of as a multiple of the volume of the carapace. So length times width times height will determine the volume of the shield of the turtle. And so the first principal component will be proportionate to the volume of the carapace. However, please note that such an interpretation will not always exist. And more often than not, it is not possible to find an interpretation. So it is nice if you can find an interpretation, but do not spend too much time on explaining or trying to explain what the principal components might mean, because a lot of the times there is no meaning, no real world, no physical world meaning to a principal component. It is just a mathematical linear combination of the variables in such a way that they are optimal for the principal component analysis, but this does not mean that there has to be an interpretation. In practice, the data are also often first standardized before applying principal component analysis. As you know, standardization means that we subtract the mean and then we divide by the standard deviation. The reason why we do this standardization will become clear in a couple of slides. And to do it in R is very easy. You just do the PR comp and you add the additional option scale equal true. And then PR comp, the function PR comp, will perform this standardization itself you as a user do not have to do anything special. In matrix notation, you can then write that the standardized observation i, zi, is v1 half to the power minus one times xi, so my observation without standardization, minus the mean, the uh, or at least the vector of the mean. So it is v1 half to the power minus one times xi minus the vector of the means. In this formula, v to the power one half is a diagonal matrix, diagonal matrix with on the diagonal all the standard deviations and everything else equal to zero. In this case, the expected value of z is zero, so we center it around the origin, which is after all the purpose of standardization. And the covariance, you can calculate this, we won't look into the details. We see that the covariance of z, so the covariance of my standardized observations, is the correlation of x, the correlation of my non-standardized observations. So if we want to perform a principal component analysis on the standardized data, we would have to calculate the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of z. 
and we now see that this is the same as calculating them on the correlation matrix of X. So the principal components for the standardized data can be found through an eigenvector and eigenvalue analysis on the sample correlation matrix of the original data. So we take R, the correlation matrix of the original data, and we calculate the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors for this matrix R. Hence, there is no need to first calculate those uh, standardized values. We can just work with the original values and we change S by R. Let's now take a look at why we would standardize our data. Assume we have a covariance matrix S given by 1, 4, 4, 100 and the corresponding correlation matrix R. So you can verify that R, which corresponds to S, is 1, 0 0.4, 0 0.41. What we see in our covariance matrix S is that the second diagonal element here, so the variance of the second random variable X2, is very large. We can then calculate the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So for S, lambda 1 is 100.16, lambda 2 is 0.84, and V1 and V2 are given on the slide. Same thing for R, lambda 1 is 1.4, and lambda 2 is 0.6. What we can observe is that the matrix R is a symmetric matrix. And furthermore, we see that the eigenvalues for S are very different. So lambda 1 is 100.16, lambda 2 is 0.84. So there is a factor of, all, well, a little more than 100 in difference. Whereas the eigenvalues for R, 1.4 and 0.6, they are not as far apart. If we then calculate the principal components, we find that for S, my first principal component, y1, is 0 0.04 times x1 plus 0 0.999 times x2. And the second one, y2, is 0 0.999 x1 minus 0 0.04 times x2. So we see in this case that y1 is approximately the same as x2 and y2 is almost the same as x1. On the other hand, the principal components for r really are linear combinations of my standardized data. So it's 0 0.707 times Z1 plus 0 0.707 times Z2 for the first one and 0 0.707 Z1 minus 0 0.707 Z2 for the second one. The fact that in this case the loadings or at least the absolute values of the loadings are the same has to do with the fact that the matrix R was a symmetric matrix. So we notice that the second variable X2 will completely dominate the first principal component of S. So we saw that Y1, the first principal component, is approximately the same as X2, the second variable. And the reason for this is that the variance of X2 was so large. So X2, the variance of X2 was 100. The total variance is 101. And so almost all the variation in my data is contained in my second variable. This often is the case because the data or the different variables are not measured on the same scale and the scales have a different importance. So what we want to do is we want to eliminate this scale influence by standardizing the data. So after standardization, we see that Z1 and Z2 contribute equally in my principal component analysis. And my first principal component will, in this case, explain 70% of the total variance and not already 99%. So we see that the relative importance of the variables will be influenced by the standardization. The principal components of S and R are clearly different. Also, there does not exist a rule to convert the principal components of S into the principal components of R. You cannot just transform them from one into the other. When to standardize? Well, the variables should be standardized if they are measured on different scales. If not, then the first principal component will be completely attracted to the variable with the largest spread. So this would be the general rule on when to standardize, but in practice it will never hurt to standardize. And so if you are not certain whether or not to standardize, it is always safer to use standardized data instead of non-standardized data. We can also give a geometrical interpretation to principal components. So we know that principal components are a linear combination of my original variables. And if we look at it geometrically, 
linear combinations just represent new coordinate systems. So it's a new coordinate system obtained through an orthogonal transformation of the original axis. By definition, or by construction, these new axes will be the eigenvectors v1, v2, up to vp, and each of these axes will lie in the direction of maximal variance. So we will first look in the direction of the largest variance. This will be the direction determined by v1. This will become our new first axis. And then we look for the second direction, v2, which will be the direction which has the largest variance and lies orthogonal, so in an angle of 90 degrees with v1. And then v3 is the largest direction which is orthogonal to v1 and v2 and so on. To visualize this a little bit more, we have our data set, so the black points are the data set that we have, and the black lines are just the basic coordinate system, so x1 and x2. We see that in this example, the data are quite elliptical. And so the main variance is in the direction of the main axis of the ellipse, so it is the uh, direction which is here indicated by PC1, the first principal component. The second direction will have to be orthogonal, so it has to have an angle of 90 degrees with the first principal component. So it will in this case be the direction of the second axis of my ellipse or the one indicated by PC2. If my dataset is very large, performing linear regression on this dataset might not be feasible or it might not give good results because of multicollinearity. So the idea would then be to not do a linear regression on the entire data set, so on all the variables, but only do a linear regression on a small set of derived inputs Z1 to Zm. One example of linear regression on such a small set of derived inputs is PCR, principal component regression, and then Z1 to Zm are in this case the principal components. When we do this, we will always first center and scale the predictor, so we will always first standardize them. There is no exception. If we do a principal component regression, there is first standardization. And then what we do is we do just a simple linear regression on the first M principal components. So we select the first M principal components in such a way that they still explain a lot of the variation in the data. And we do a linear regression on Z1 to Zm instead of linear regression on X1 to Xp. Now, since the principal components are orthogonal predictors, we get a nice bonus. Namely, that instead of doing one multivariate regression, we can do m univariate regressions and add them. So we can make the sum of m univariate regressions. This means that we can replace our multivariate regression, so explaining why, in function of Z1 to Zm, by different univariate regressions. So we first explain why in function of Z1, we explain why in function of Z2, and so on up to why in function of Zm, and then we just make the sum of all those different univariate regressions. So the first regression will give me that y is theta hat PCR 1 times Z1. The second gives me y is theta hat 2 PCR Z2 and so on. These coefficients theta hat PCR, they are just the basic linear regression or the least square solution of a basic linear regression of y on Zm. And then we take all those univariate regressions, all those solutions, and we just add them, we take the sum of it. So what we now get is that y explained by Z1 to Zm is y explained by Z1 plus y explained by Z2 plus y explained by Z3 and so on and so on. The reason for this is that they are orthogonal, the principal components are orthogonal, and hence there is no overlap in information. So each of the information is completely different from the previous information. And so this is the reason why you can take the sum of those univariate regressions and it will give you the same solution as the multivariate regression. If m is equal to p, so we take all the principal components, we do not make a selection, then the solution that we find is equal to the least squares solution. Otherwise, if m is smaller than p, then 
principal component regression will select an optimal solution in an m-dimensional subspace of the p-dimensional subspace spanned by the columns of x. So basically, instead of looking for a solution in p-dimensions, as defined by the variables x1 to xp, we will look for the best possible solution in m-dimensions defined by z1 to zm. And then the final slide will make a small comparison between principal component regression and ridge regression. But since we did not see ridge regression, you can just ignore this slide.